Hello, it's the Liverpool Echoes Blood Red podcast. I'm Matt Addison with Paul Gorse, Joe Rimmer and Theo Squires all alongside me. On the agenda today, a quick look back at Norwich, a preview of West Ham United and quite possibly a mention or two of the quadruple and Jurgen Klopp's future. Gorsley, before we look ahead to Saturday, let's have a look back at Wednesday night when a much changed Liverpool team took on Norwich in the FA Cup. Takumi Minamino, one of the big stories coming out of that game, was that his best performance in a Liverpool shirt? Do you think that's fair to say? 100%, yeah. Um, can't think of any other game that would rival it, to be honest. He was uh, he obviously took his goals really well. The second one in particular, great finish, but... His all-round game, he, he was lively, he was a threat, he was popping up on the right, popping up down the centre, up on the left. Just everything he did was just really neat and tidy and he looked a real um, a real threat for Liverpool. That hasn't always been the case. You know, this is someone who scored nine goals now for the season, which is, you know, it might surprise some people that he's ahead of Firmino in the ranks and only Mane, Jota and uh, Salah have scored more. He's got a really good goals to minutes ratio as well. But I think watching him over the last two years, looking around thinking, does this does this guy fit in long term? Is he someone who, who Liverpool could rely on if Salah was injured for three, four, five weeks? Uh, and I think the answer would probably be no. But when he puts in performances like that, you just you kind of think, well, Liverpool need players like this, you know, now the the fighting on four fronts. Uh, they're not going to be able to play Salah, Mane, Jota every minute of every game. So the likes of Origi and, and Minamino have, have still got a role to play between now and the end of the season. And Minamino played this to perfection on Wednesday night. Uh, as, as I say, to answer your question, Matt, I do think it was his best Liverpool performance. I think I, I wrote as much in in the verdict the full time. And, and Klopp was full of praise for him after the game. He said he hasn't always had it easy because he came January 2020. It was you know, locked down within six weeks of him arriving. He was, you know, in in a flat in Liverpool City Centre on his own. He didn't have any family members around him, didn't really speak English. And it was tough for him to adapt. Um, and he never really had a chance to build up head of steam since then. But um, if he can carry on putting in the kinds of performances that we've seen on Wednesday night, when he gets his chance, then um, he could still be a, a valuable asset. Yeah, he's never going to be the, the first name on the team sheet, Joe. But as Gorsley says, nine goals so far this season. I think we saw a little bit as well with the, the celebrations at, at Wembley last weekend in your favourite competition. Of course, Liverpool players putting forward Minamino for a little bit of a, a celebration of his own, really, because he has made a, a huge contribution in that sort of competition, the FA Cup now as well. He's a big part of where Liverpool find themselves at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I just... <laughs> I'd just been thinking then as you were talking uh, and I Googled it, um, you know, players like Minamino, if Liverpool want to go and win, I don't know, you know quad, quadruple, we all get a bit carried away at the moment saying quadruple, which, I, you know, I get we should do, um, we should enjoy it. Um, but if Liverpool want to win numerous trophies, then you need players like Minamino to chip in. So it, so it got me thinking, you think back to the treble season and, the, you know, the Liverpool then had a really, really big squad. And you look at some of the, the goal contributions from players. I mean, that's just read them out. Top scorer, Owen, 24. Even better than that, Emil Heskey, 22. Robbie Fowler got 17. Uh, Murphy, 10. Gerard 10. Barnby, 8. McAllister, 8. Smeeter, 6. Babel, 7. Um, you know, you look at all those goal contributions and think, well, Minamino can play a role like the Barnbys, like the Smeeters of, of that squad. And help Liverpool win trophies by scoring goals in those competitions, and and that's what you need if you if you to succeed in all these different competitions, you need people to to chip in, and and, and Minamino's doing that. So, you know, it's really pleasing to see, and he when he gets chances, he's taking them. And look, he's not going to be a long term thing. You know, those those players I've just mentioned, the like the Smicer and Murphy, and 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 other players like that, sort of moved on, didn't they? But Minamino will move on, but he will have chipped in and contributed, hopefully. To, uh, to Liverpool winning trophies. He's already done that with one. Hopefully Liverpool can win in the FA Cup and other competitions as well. So I think he I think we often like to, to say, oh, is he is he going to be a replacement for Salah or Mane? He's not, no, I mean, but he doesn't have to be. And um, you know, clubs need squad players and that they need to they need to make themselves counted when when they play and he's doing that. So, you know, 
that, that that's great for Liverpool. And yeah, really pleased to to finally get on a pod after the, the Caraboa, as Klopp calls it, the Caraboa Cup, um, because you know I was forced out on Monday. <laughs> uh, I've been on the Caraboa train before it was cool, back when it was Coca Cola, back when it was milk. No, I was there. <laughs> well, of course, they jump on at the end, don't they? Glory and 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 so all in. But you can't about, include me in that, Joe. Uh, you know, I, I've noticed this season you've started jumping on the it's more fun <laughs> train. And I'm not, I don't need your support. I don't need it. <laughs> I've been saying it all along. It's a, it's a great competition, and, I, and I, I've enjoyed it. And, and how good was Sunday, by the way? You know, I, I know we want to talk about Norwich. No, no one cares. And we want to talk about we want to talk about West Ham, but Sunday. Was was really good. The game was amazing. One of the best nil nils you'll see. Fair play to Chelsea. You know, I, I kind of think of them as I never think of them as an attacking side. I never think of them as a as an entertaining side. But you know, both teams made it one hell of a final. And it was just really great to watch. Great ending. And yeah, I loved it. So um, very happy. Enjoyed this week. Yeah, it's certainly so, set up a, a promising end to the season, hasn't it, Theo? I mean, Joe's mentioned there that obviously the the first. Cup win could be the first of, of four, potentially. People starting to get excited about the quadruple. Jurgen Klopp, certainly not one of those. He's been very, very keen to kind of, of dampen that talk. But what is realistic for Liverpool this season? I mean, the, the quadruple is hard to achieve, but not impossible. It's just one of those things where Liverpool can, they can talk about that. They can, because they're in this position. And the Carabao Cup has, has set up the rest of the season for that to be the case. Joe just drinking a, a can of Carabao there. Is that you showing how much he loves yeah, the competition? Is, <laughs> no, I, I, honestly, I, I've been... Uh, uh, Carabao should send me crates of the stuff for, for the, the support I've given them. If you're listening, Carabao. You, you have the apple blast over your cereal, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I give it to my kids in the bottles. <laughs> right, so um, question. Can Liverpool win quadruple? What's realistic for them? Um... I said this on Monday's podcast. What is good for them is they're in this situation where they can talk about it, they can aim to win all these trophies, but they're not under any pressure to do so. It's not like Manchester City when they were going for the quadruple a few years ago when they've never won the European Cup. So they've got that intense pressure on them to deliver that each season. And that's why they fall short. Whereas Liverpool can be so relaxed about everything because we didn't expect them to be in a title race two months ago. And now here they are, they're breathing down Man City's next. They've got the first trophy of the season and they've won the Champions League before. They've now won at Wembley in a domestic cup final. They have done everything before. It's just a case of doing it again. And you can tell the players are confident. You can tell they're relaxed. And of course, Jurgen Klopp's going to play it down. He's not going to come out with stupid comments and say, we're going to win the quadruple because it'll blow up in their faces. He's not going to do the Man City formidables thing, which I swear they must have been pushing out from like November before they eventually fell short. Like Liverpool just take it a game at a time, or at least publicly anyway. Like We know behind the scenes, they will be getting a little bit excited and aiming for more trophies. It's the same as when they won the Premier League. Every single week they came out and said, it's just one game at a time, we're not thinking about it. Then they won it and all the messages from the WhatsApp groups came out, all the message, um, texts in like books and stuff like Andy Robertson released his book. And they were admitting that they believe they're going to win the league or they could focus on it from like Christmas time. Liverpool will believe they can go all the way in the Champions League, they can go all the way in the FA Cup and they can catch City because they've done it all before. It is just who they get in these competitions. And that's why they've got to focus one game at a time. Um, we'll be saying it on each podcast now. We don't think Liverpool can do it because it's never been done before. We've got to play it down in that sense. But then you see Liverpool and um, take it a very an isolated game. In 90 minutes, they can beat anyone. So if they just do 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes, there is no reason to believe they can't do all four. They've got the talent. It's just whether everything aligns together between now and the end of the season. And it's going to make for a hell of a two, three month spell. Yeah, it's, it's not the Carabao Cup, Joe. It's it's the FA Cup, the quarterfinals that Liverpool are into now. And obviously Nottingham Forest or, or Huddersfield Town next. That feels like a, an opportunity to, to go a little bit further in that competition as well. It's a it's a decent draw out for Liverpool, I think. That was that to me, I told Joe. That was to Joe, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry, I, I actually stopped to, when you said yeah, that. Cool. Yeah, feel free to jump in. As <laughs> I soon as I said thought, it wasn't the Carabao was course, Cup, Joe was yeah. not interested. I did genuinely stop interest, and so of course you're probably best answering that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if Liverpool are going to get near this quadruple, they need favourable draws, don't they? So um, certainly playing the championship side, whether it's Huddersfield or Nottingham Forest, 
it's preferable to draw on a, a Man City um, or a Chelsea or, dare it even be said, an Everton. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I was fairly happy with that draw when it was made yesterday evening. Um, an away tie. It's either back to uh, Huddersfield or the, uh, the... Is it still the City ground? Forest? Um, obviously, Forest are a kind of big name, aren't they, in English football history? I, I still think of them as a as a Premier League side, to be honest, when they have Brian Roy and Collymore and, you know, all those types of players. So, um, they've seen off Arsenal this season, so I'm sure they'll be delighted to get Liverpool at home and, and they'll obviously... Be fighting for that one, but um, I think Liverpool have just got to carry on doing what they're doing, making the changes here and there when they can. Uh, I, I imagine it'll be much stronger tomorrow evening than it was on Wednesday night. But um, I'd have no qualms with that team on Wednesday playing Nottingham Forest or Huddersfield, uh, when is it in a couple of weeks' time? So, yeah, let's say Liverpool are taking it game by game, but as Theo says about them, just slightly thinking that it could possibly be done. I think the fact that they, cut, they all come out with um, Carabao Cup champions t-shirts after the, the win against Chelsea shows you that behind the scenes there is some thought being given to succeeding in these trophies. And, and why not? Because, you know, it's the me and Joe are the same age, used to be a little bit younger, but it's the best Liverpool squad in, in any of our lifetimes. Um, so uh, who knows what can be achieved? Yeah, absolutely. Got to take it game by game, of course. And that means West Ham next, Joe. We heard from Jurgen Klopp previewing that in his press conference a little bit earlier on today. For the first time in a while, actually, a few sort of injury absences or certainly injury doubts to, to talk through. Four or five players that Liverpool might be missing. But as we've said so many times this season, the squad depth is so strong that even if those players do miss out, you'd still probably fancy Liverpool to put out a, a decent team and make a, a decent fist to that game. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's frustrating, is it? Let's, let's not lie. You know, again, I think we're looking at the two players that we all desperately want to see fit and play. Um, Thiago, and I, I noticed you mentioned Cater as well, who wasn't in the squad on Wednesday. And, you know, for them and for Liverpool, it would be nice if they could stay fit um, and play. Um, you know, again, it looks like in midfield they're going to have they're going to have problems in terms of rotation. But they have got a big enough squad. You know, I, I don't think, you know, Joel Matip is probably having his best season for Liverpool by a, by a million miles. But none of us are going to sit here and grumble about Ibrahima Kanate playing or even Joe Gomez if he played. But, you know, I think it speaks volumes about Kanate. Um, that, I, I, you know, I, I think he looks a really fantastic young defender. And, you know, you, you've got absolutely... If Liverpool playing City tomorrow and, and Matip wasn't available... I don't think I would I would worry too much because I think Kanate is is capable. Um, so you know credit to him. And Liverpool have got the players in other positions, haven't they? You know, and it'd be good to have Firmino back. It looks like he'd be back for for Tuesday against Inter Milan. So um, that's a really big boost for Liverpool. But yeah, I mean, you need a bit of luck with injuries. Look, I mean, you're almost not allowed to. to you're not going to hope other teams get injuries. But Man City have just you know. Have, I've just said that Ruben Diaz is out for five, six weeks. And look, that, that will help Liverpool. It, it's not going to help City. So, you know, Liverpool were decimated with injuries last year and it helped other clubs the year before that. City had, had issues and it helped Liverpool. So, yeah, you know, you hope that that, that weakness for City will, will be taken advantage of and, you know, start with Man United on Sunday. So Liverpool need to continue to have luck with injuries, but luckily they do have a squad to handle it. Yeah, Matter being out there presumably means Ibrahim Konate will come in. Jurgen Klopp praised him as well in his press conference earlier on today. And he's absolutely right, isn't he? He's absolutely settled in brilliantly into to life at, at Liverpool this season. Yeah, I don't think I'd have started Matip for this one anyway, even if he wasn't ill when you've got Inter Milan on the horizon. It seems like a good game to have Canate or Gomez keep in that place so they can get a bit of rhythm. But yeah, he's looked superb, hasn't he? Like Considering... What, over a year ago, there was all those problems at centre back, and fans were wanting Kabak to sign permanently, or and they were worried in January when Liverpool didn't move earlier, and it looked very desperate when they got Kabak and Ben Davis in. You could see Liverpool just biding their time. They knew who they wanted, they knew when they could get them, and they waited until the summer and they got someone who looks a perfect fit for them. He's got pace, he can pass the ball, he's good in the air. Canate looks like he's got a bit of everything. I said to Gorsley in midweek during the game, he reminds me of it like this mixture of Van Dijk and Sacco in that he's very unorthodox, but he's very effective as well and he's got that calm head of 
Van Dyke without being as clumsy or having a mistake in him as Sacco did. It's like the best of both worlds. And it's telling that he's, he's so young and Liverpool got him in. He's had a fair bit of football this year. He is going to be future of this defence, isn't he? Like Van Dyke's not going to go on forever. Yeah, he's got a long-term uh, contract, but it is going to be another gradual change in the guard there with Canate emerging in this new defensive linchpin. And he's got everything you need to succeed as a leading centre-back in Premier League football. He's only, what, a little over six months into his Liverpool career and he's already got this cut, bit of a cult following behind him. He's won his first trophy, hopefully the, the first of many. He deserves all the praise he's got because it's not easy to settle into a new country, especially when you're so young. I know we're, we've had those excuses for Minimino when he's coming in in the middle of the pandemic, but it's the same for all these players coming from foreign leagues when they might not speak the language that well and they're coming away from the families and they don't know when they'll be able to travel and see them and stuff. It's going to be a big adjustment for any of them. And he has just settled in really well and he looks made for Premier League football. Like I said, I'd probably have started him this weekend anyway. It's a good opportunity for him uh, against Mikel Antonio. Bit of pace, bit of power there as well. Could be an interesting battle. And he's going to be needed between now and the end of the season. It will play certainly a lot more than he did in the first half, just because it's going to be those rotation between League Cup, um, League Cup, League, Champions League, and FA Cup. Hopefully, come May, it's not just the one winners man always got in his collection. Yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, the other injury doubts, of course, is over Curtis Jones, who obviously came off midweek, came off at half time, didn't he, uh, against Norwich, and thought he was doing pretty well in in that game. But it sort of sums up his season a little bit in that he's come in, done well, got injured. That seems to be a, a bit of a pattern this season. Yeah, it does. He was kind of making a real claim for himself, wasn't he, around about October time, late September. He he, he played really well against. Brentford, he started against Man City and then he got the eye injury and then he got COVID and then he again kind of showed up well towards mid-January when Liverpool were struggling for bodies and then players come back, he drops off the squad, comes back in, plays well and then picks up a slight injury again. So it's been very stop star for him, which is a bit of a shame, but um, I've, I've no real concerns over Curtis Jones long term. He only turned 21 in January, so um, he's just got to try and do what he can do to make make himself seen. Really, when he when he gets a chance, um, Liverpool are obviously well stocked for midfielders, but we've touched on Thiago and, and Keita tend to have quite a few injury problems, don't they? So, I suppose for him, it's just about you know impression when he gets the chance. And, and to be fair to him, he, he has done that in the main since the turn of the year, um, and have no real. Worries about him in, in the long term. I'd say he's only just turned 21. He's played up to 60 odd games now for this Liverpool team. So, um, yeah, no no real worries over him. He was Plenty superb in that first half in midweek as well. He was unlucky not to um, be able to carry on with the injury. You can understand why Liverpool don't want to take risks with him when they are balanced in this squad. But if it is another injury that's going to keep him out for a couple of games, it just seems such bad timing when you've got Thiago injured and Naby Keita. I think Jurgen Klopp was quite cryptic about that. And the fact that he just sort of dropped it in there, that they don't know how long he's out for. Uh, oh, he wasn't in the squad in midweek, was he? Well, no one thought of anything about that in midweek. They just assumed he was being rested. So that if there's a bigger injury there or if it's just managing it carefully, but it would have been a chance for Curtis Jones, you imagine, tomorrow. I'd have seen him starting when you think of who they've got available when you've got Inter Milan on the horizon. Um, but that's what his season's been like and what the last 18 months has been like from him, really. He gets in the team, he's playing well, and then players come back from injury and he loses his place or he gets an injury at the wrong time. It's all very stop-start. But as Gorsty says, it's not anything to get worried about because he is still so young. It's just the roller coaster ride you have as a young footballer trying to find your way at one of the top sides in European football. Um, yeah, I can imagine he's very frustrated. I think any player would be when they've been in the team just before a Wembley final appearance and they get left out of the squad. But hopefully that gives him something to prove because if the 45 minutes we saw in midweek was him responding to being left out at Wembley and wanting to prove he should be higher up in the pecking order in his manager's plans, uh, and there's plenty of stages, plenty of platforms for him to do so between now and the rest of the season when he does come back from injury. But yeah, it is poor timing for him. He's unlucky there. 
yeah, plenty more chances to come for him in the future, I'm sure. And speaking of futures, Joe, Jurgen Klopp clarified his own future today in his press conference. There was a, a bit of a, a hint, so we thought midweek that he might be open to extending, but it seems like he's, well, maybe not gone back on that, but certainly clarified the comments that he'd made a, a couple of days ago. Yeah, he said to me that he sort of wished, um, wished the words hadn't come out of his mouth in midweek. Um, and just said, you know, the plan hasn't changed. The plan we thought was um, that he would he would leave the club in, in 2024. Um, but then, you know, we thought he'd leave the club in 2022, didn't we? And it, he ended up signing a, a two-year extension. So, you know, I, I think the club, you know, I think he has a sort of broad plan. He doesn't like to overstay as well. He's not going to do like an Alex Ferguson and, and be Liverpool manager for 20 years. But I, I don't think... I've got a sneaky feeling that... that the door could still be open for him to stay on a, a little bit longer. You know, I, I, I think if he's not too stressed and then still enjoying the job and, you know, all is well at home, then he'd probably stay on a little bit further. He seems to enjoy himself at Liverpool. He seems to be settled here. Um, you know, but even so, the the, the the heartening thing to hear from him was that the plans are in place, that, you know, they're not just planning for the next two years of Jurgen Klopp. He's not Mourinho, is he? doesn't... He doesn't just think about what he can he can do in the next two years. He thinks about what the club can do, and you know he said some really good stuff about making sure the club is in a great position uh, when he leaves, and you know far better than when he, what he found it anyway. So, you know, I, I think look, Liverpool would be very lucky to continue the way they are when Jurgen Klopp leaves the club because he's such a he's such a brilliant manager, isn't he? In personality that. It's going to be very difficult. Liverpool won't be able to replace him. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to just carry on. And we've seen before that when big personalities leave clubs, that there can be a slight decline. But Liverpool have got to do what they can now, and the owners have got to do what they can now to make sure that that decline isn't something like United, where mistakes were made in the years leading up to Ferguson's departure. And when he did depart, you know, I think we saw we all saw that perhaps things at the club weren't quite as good as you thought because he was there. So I, I don't think that's the case in Liverpool. I think they do seem to be building for the long term. They do seem to be buying players, giving out contracts and, and scouting the right players. So um, I think Liverpool are in, in good shape for when Klopp does leave. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he stays a little bit longer than 2024, all being well. What's your thoughts on it, Gorst? It's, it's interesting, I think, in terms of obviously there being no fans for one of the seasons. I think there's there's a sort of argument to kind of make up for that and extend the contract to make up for that time. It, you know, it's, it's still a couple of years away from being yeah. 2024, but it, it still does sort of feel like a little bit early to, to be having these conversations that he might move on then. It, it feels like there would still be, still be more to come from him almost in that time. Yeah, I mean, the indications I get from, from him when you hear him speak about it is essentially he doesn't want to stay on. He feels like 2024 is nine years of very stressful, high-intensity work, and he thinks that that might be enough. Um, and he'll ride off into the sunset having won what he's already won and maybe a couple of other things to go with it. Um, I feel as though he's just he's saying everything but that, really, but I don't really get the inclination that he'd look to stay on um now whether the ownership encourage him um or give him a kind of incentive or lean on him and say any chance you're staying on i think that maybe could work in Liverpool's favor to make him have a think about it but i think unless he's given that encouragement i don't think i, I imagine he will leave in, in 2024 when his contract ends i mean Look, I mean, given his, his power and his status within the club and the fan base, he could get on the phone to John Henry now, couldn't he, and say, I want X, X amount of money over the next three years or whatever, and it would be signed and sealed before before you've got your tea on the table tonight, given just how much he means to the club. But I don't, I don't get the idea or the feeling that that is what he's after at the moment. Now, whether, as I say, if Tom Werner or, you know, whoever it be, Mike Gordon most likely can kind of lean on him and, and speak to him about it then maybe something could be forthcoming if he has a good long hard think about it but everything that he's saying at the moment it, it just seems as though he's not really thinking about it and he does feel as though he'll need a break in 2024 as joe says theo i mean is there a kind of feeling at, at liverpool that 
if he was to move on in 2024, they'd be in a decent position to to carry on. Is there enough of a, a framework in place, do you think, to be able to maybe not continue at the exact same level, but maybe not drop off too far from where they are now? Yeah, I think so. I think they've known the day that he's going to leave has been coming for a while, whether it's in 2024, 2026, 2025, 2023, whenever Liverpool have made the plans for it and they're making sure that there is this easy transition as Joe's mentioned, you just need to look at how they've approached the squad where they put so much detail into the scouting and bringing it through these players. It isn't just a case of we're going to sell X or lose X, Y, Z this summer and then we get a replacement. It's that gradual succession. That's how come Jota, Diaz, Carty, these players have come in to work alongside the players they will ultimately be taking the place of over the few years' time. And Liverpool has always been thinking of that long-term plan. They spent so many years out in the wilderness just wanting to win trophies again, never mind being in the Champions League again, challenging for the titles. They, they know how much they need to get it right. And you look at how Klopp's been in this position before at Dortmund, at Mainz, where he left after a long period of time and he wanted the club to be in the best position possible. It's not a case of it's the Jurgen Klopp story. Liverpool are great because he turned up and then he wants them to be rubbish again when he leaves and you can say it's all me. He wants them to be as successful as possible when he goes. That is his legacy. Um, FSG want the same thing. I, I think I've just done a, a comment piece on it and he's like he's the custodian waiting to pass on the baton whenever that may be. Uh, it's a relay race and it's not Liverpool success ends when Klopp goes. It's just the next chapter of him passing it on. And whether it's someone who's working closely with him now or if it's someone coming in from the outside, that all of them will want Liverpool to still be a successful team. Um, look at how Julian Ward's now taken over as sporting director and he's done that succession there. He's played a big part in getting Luis Diaz in. That gives me hope that Liverpool will do it the right way. They will manage to make the right appointments and just carry it on because that would have been a hard a succession to replace Michael Edwards to still manage to sign the right players and get the right deals but they've handled that well so far from the little we've seen and if they're doing that behind the scenes with the sporting directors and that we've seen they're doing it on the pitch it's often in plain sight bringing some of these younger players and signing um, handing out new contracts and that then you'd like to think that it's going to be a similar style for the manager and when Klopp knows that that day's coming John Henry and the rest of FSG know that day's coming they are all on the same page. It's just waiting for the actual date it happens. They'll have a better idea of it behind the scenes of when it actually is coming. Because so I think if you'd have asked Jurgen Klopp a year ago, are you going to leave in 2024? He'd have said yes. It, it almost fallen out of love with football when Liverpool going through such a horrible run of a results without fans. But now they're in a situation where he's proven that it wasn't a fluke than winning the Premier League and the Champions League. It is a, a great team. We just had one bad year because of injuries. Um, so he might be on the fence or still got a lot to decide. As, as you said, two years is a long time. Uh, I think Pep Guardiola is supposed to be leaving City in 2023. And when you've got these next younger players coming through in 2024, maybe you'll see it as an opportunity to get a few years of dominance and properly push City out the way. Or maybe you will think that's enough. This club is in a great position with young players coming through, with players contracted until 26, 27, and he can just pass on the baton and Liverpool can carry on success. Um, it has been done before at Liverpool, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan, Kenny Dalgleish, but then we've seen the other side of it as well. They're in as good a position to carry on with the success as they can be, but that doesn't mean it's a certainty. Yeah, plenty to think about over the next couple of years. I'm sure we'll touch on this topic a few times in that period. But let's go back to, to West Ham, Joe. They've not been maybe in the, the best form of late. They were knocked out of the FA Cup midweek. I think they've only scored eight goals in the last seven games. David Moyes doesn't particularly have a brilliant record at, at Anfield either. What are you kind of expecting from this weekend's game? And is it an opportunity really for Liverpool to, to make a bit of a statement if they're at it? I don't know whether it's about making a statement, to be honest. I think it's just about closing the gap, isn't it? And getting it back down to three points. You know, Liverpool are going first. Man City have got a really big game on Sunday. And, um, you know, I, I, you get the feeling, don't you, at the moment, that, that Man City are feeling the heat a little bit, that they're feeling the pressure from Liverpool. A lot of the talk has swung Liverpool's way. Um, and Liverpool are dealing with it quite well. So I, I don't think it's about making a statement. You know, I, I think it, Liverpool can beat West Ham 1-0. And make the statement that you know they keep winning games and they're closing the gap, and I think it will be difficult. You know, I think so. You on about West Ham, and perhaps they're not in the greatest form. And I know David Moyes doesn't have the greatest record at Anfield, but to be fair, you know, I, 
I can't remember too many times Liverpool have, have annihilated David Moyes' teams at Anfield. He, he does make things tricky for you. And, you know, they, they've got big physical players, West Ham, um, that can, you know, they can score goals from various parts of the pitch. So I, I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park for Liverpool. Um, I actually think it'd be quite close. So, you know, again, I, I don't think a statement is winning big. I think a statement for Liverpool right now is winning. And, it, and if they can do that every week, the pressure will be on City and, and I get the feeling City are starting to sweat a little bit. So it's just all about winning. How much of a difference does that make, Gorsi, do you think? Obviously, we've seen in, in previous, well, the, the last time, in fact, that Liverpool played first, City then dropped points, didn't they, the, uh, sort of two or three hours later against Tottenham. I mean, how much of a, a difference would it make if Liverpool can win to the impact of, of what might happen in the Manchester derby on Sunday? Sorry, was that to me or, or Theo? Yeah, that was to that was to you, mate. Yeah, yeah. I think Joe makes a good point about um, Liverpool playing before Manchester City um, to put the pressure on City because for far too long Liverpool have been playing catch up. Um, City always seem to be playing first, whether it's a Saturday afternoon or Liverpool playing Sunday afternoon. You know, City just tend to have taken care of their business, and all Liverpool have been able to do is just keep the you know, stay on the coattails. I think tomorrow offers them a good chance in, in a similar way to the way Norwich did, actually. Um, the Norwich game a couple of weeks ago, just to, to put the ball back in their court and make sure that they've got to take care of business. And I think, you know, the um, the Manchester derby will be a big one for them because United have got a good record against City in, in recent years. I mean, we, you know, that United are nowhere near what the United, what they should be at the moment. But, he tend to play a bit of a counter the second game, and obviously that was more under Solskjaer. He kind of made no bones about it when he went to the Etihad. He played on the break, and it worked. Whether Ralph Rangnick, you know, has a similar approach, I'm not too sure. The dog walked past me there, but um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I haven't been overly impressed with United. I don't think much has changed since, since Ralph Rangnick came in. They just seem to be still the same team, stagnant, with a different manager. But um, hopefully. They can do Liverpool a, a massive favour on Sunday afternoon, but as you say, Liverpool have got to take care of business first. And as Joe says, it isn't about making a statement, is it? It's just about winning, getting those three points on the board, getting to within three points and then saying to City, OK, what, what have you got in response to that one? Because um, if they slip up against United, then it's it's huge, isn't it? Yeah, Liverpool just got to focus on themselves, haven't they? And with that in mind, we shall pick our team for the game. Theo, I'll come to you first. I think we will all assume that Alison Becker will be in goal. The, the back four, we kind of know who's not going to be there, but who are you going to pick to, to play across that back line? I should say, what a professional ghost he is there, keeping his cool with a dog walking over his shoulders, not battering an eyelid. <laughs> for those listening, one. by the way, it's, it's not a Rottweiler walking over his shoulders. It's not like he's got like a, the biggest <laughs> dog in the world walking over his shoulders. It's, um, it's just a little. What is it? What is it? A mix of pug and what? Pug and a dash hand. Pug and a dash hand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Back four. Um, I reckon Trent, Robertson, Van Dijk, and I'd lean towards. Well, part of me would like to see Gomez play to have a second game in a row at centre back. It just depends how long Matip's out for. But if it's going to be an illness, I'd imagine he'll go with Canate. So I'd want to see Gomez play, but I reckon he'll go with Canate. Yeah, I'm with you 100% on that one, Joe. Who are you going to go for? Canate, just because I, I just, I just really like him. Really been impressed by him, and the more I can, I can see him play. Um, it's good for him, and you know, I quite like watching him play as well. So Canate, and I think physical West Ham aren't they? Some big players, set pieces. So yeah, makes sense. Yep, certainly does make sense, Gorsty. If that's the same for you, do you want to move on to the midfield for us as well? Yeah, full house, Canate. Um... Midfield, Fabinho. I'm not sure about Henderson actually because he he played Wednesday, didn't he? Which I'm surprised about. Um, given only he only played an hour, didn't he? Yeah, he only played an hour. What, what did he, what did he play in, in the final? Was it eight, 70, 80 minutes? I suppose he did, didn't play the full one twenty, did he? Um, I suppose with no Cater or Thiago, the, the numbers are a little bit thinner on the ground than, than they have been in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I'll go with Fabinho, Henderson, and then, I don't know, really. H Elliot? Yeah, that, that was my third man. I think Fabinho and, and Henderson 
pretty nailed on, Theo. Elliot, for me, is there a, a different one for, for you? There's not quite as many options as there has been in, in recent weeks. I'm saving Henderson for Inter Milan at these couple of starts. I think that's the sort of game you need him in more. I'm going for Alex Oxley chamberlain He's got this great record, I think, against West Ham. It might be more the away games, but he always seems to have a good game against them. I think probably has been linked with in the past as well. Um, I think him on the left, he's probably still got a bit of a point to prove. Uh, Fabinho is the number six. And then Harvey Elliott, I think it would only be his first Premier League start or second Premier League appearance since he got the injury against Leeds in uh, September. Certainly some lost time for him to make up for it. He did well when he came on at half-time in midweek. Uh, good look, chance to get a look at him. And then you're relying on your more senior players against uh, Inter Milan. But yeah, good chance to see what Elliot can do on this one, hopefully. Yeah, Alex oxlade chamberlain I didn't, didn't think was great midweek, Joe. But who are you going to go for in your, in your midfield? I'd also be tempted to go with oxlade chamberlain um, just because of the type of game I think it suits him. Um, you know, he has a decent record against West Ham in the past. And I'm just starting to think there won't be that many more chances for him. But I don't think I'd be keen to put him alongside Elliot in midfield. But, you know, again, like Gorsley said there, you know, I think I'd have been tempted had others been fit to, to bring Henderson out of it. But, you know, with the, with the injuries they've got, I think it'd be Henderson for being, you know, like you said, nailed on. Um, and, yeah, I, I'd play Oxide Chamberlain. But, again, it's a shame, isn't it, because... This, this is where, you know, like Thiago and Cater are, are unlucky in the sense that the games that you think that they would play in, they, they seem to have fitness issues. So, yeah, um, that would be my three. Yeah, Navi Cater has had one or two decent games against West Ham as well, hasn't he, in the past? But not available for this one. Front three, Gorsty, do you want to talk us through who you're going to go for? Uh, yeah, Salah, Mane. Uh, I don't think Jota is... Is hundred percent at the moment. I think he's still carrying a little bit, a little bit of that ankle problem from the Inter game. <coughs> it seems a little bit of a shame to to leave Minamino out because of how he played to the night. You know, there's no real reward for a player if you can put in a performance like that and then you get left out. Um, don't know whether I'm going to go with Minamino instead of Jota. And Diaz is there, isn't he? See, the, the, these are the options Liverpool have got now. You know, you. Used to just be you nailed on 11, didn't it? Now you're, you're thinking. Uh, I'll go Diaz, Salah, Mane. I'm going to go Salah, Jota, Mane. But just when Gorsty was talking there, Theo, a bit of me did think with maybe one or two less options in midfield, one more option in attack. Is there even a chance to, to switch the formation up? Or would you say that it's a, a nailed on 4 3 3? It's nailed on 4 3 3, Liverpool. Are not set in their ways but it's their formation it's one they know how to play and they only change it when they need to change it so if we're on the hour mark and they need a goal maybe then you'll see a 4-2-3-1 or a 4-4-2 like they did against Norwich in the league a few weeks ago but yeah 4-3-3 seems to be what they stick with it's what they know it's what they do well in no reason to really change it against West Ham um, I'd stick with Diaz Salah and Mane I agree with Gorsty Jota's still doesn't look right Um I'm not sure how much he's feeling the effects if it's just he needs some minutes but it's like well, the inter game you can make five substitutions that one's one where you can manage him a bit better the more there is that temptation with minamino um it's more a game i suppose for origi if you're really going to change the front line because you know how physical that west ham defense can be and he had a great impact away at their place earlier in the season but diaz Mane, and salah is the front three at the moment um, they have just got that little bit more quality and Liverpool need to get the wins, they need to get the goals and those three that should deliver it. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it, Joe, with Minamino with one or two other options, but which three are you going to go with? I fully agree with what Theo and, and Gorsi have said, yeah, I mean as you say it's, it's a bit harsh on Minamino and, you know, to, for him to drop out, but I, but I honestly think, you know, Liverpool can't be charitable. They've, they've got to they've got to win these games, haven't they? And and yeah, I mean, I agree as well. I don't think Jota looks quite fit. I think Theo makes a good point about the five subs um, on Tuesday night. I think that probably suits him, doesn't it, um, to bring him back in. I don't think Firmino will start that one after such a long spell out. So yeah, I, I would play those three. three. And, and again, just Diaz, more minutes for Diaz. I think it will only be beneficial for Liverpool, and it's great for us as well, isn't it? Because that's another thing at the moment. God, just love watching him. He's, there's not many players that come in 
and immediately start like he has and just you just want to see more and more football out of him don't you because he's just a stunning player to watch another one that was great in the Carabao Cup final on Sunday so yeah um, those three for me um, you know and then you can bring them off and bring Origi on and Minamino when, when the job's done yeah, David Moyes revealed I think about a week or so ago didn't he that they tried to, to sign Luis Diaz in January so a few people sure. did didn't they uh, like, yeah I think it's been overlooked quite a bit that the, the West, uh, sorry, Everton were pretty much on the verge of, yeah. uh, I think they'd agreed Everton, hadn't they? And Ames Rodriguez did us all a favour and said no, and you know he's at Liverpool, so it sounds like a lot of people were well aware of him. Yeah, certainly glad that Liverpool were the ones to get him. Let's go for some match predictions then. I think I'm going to go 3-1 to Liverpool. Gorsty, how do you reckon it might be? I mean, Liverpool don't concede many at all, do they? Um, when the the proper back five are in, shall we say? Um, so I think they might just win. You know, it's fairly comfortable. Two nil. Two nil. Theo. Um, three nil. I'm feeling a bit confident with this one. I reckon it's going to be strong back four. Can be solid defensively. Uh, West Ham haven't been the best for scoring goals recently, and I think they've only got one striker really in Antonio, and he's not been on the goal blaze at the moment, which means he'll score four. Probably. <laughs> Sorry, I just I can't. Goal goal blaze. Blaze. No, never heard that. Do you not like that? No, I've probably no. just made up, to be honest. I've I probably don't just like it. I just I <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, three 0 Three 0 A goal blaze for you, Joe? Uh, no, not a goal blaze for me. Two uh, one, I think. I, I just, I, I can, I can see Liverpool sort of taking a decent lead, and then West Ham just making it a little bit nervous towards the end, Nick and one. So, yeah, two one. I, I do think they're the sort of team that expect Liverpool to get past. But just to make things slightly nervous for them, so um, yeah, um, no, no goal, goal blaze, yeah, like that. On the goal blaze, yeah. yeah, sounds very American. It's like, um, it's like, it's like <laughs> I've been a, listening to uh, Jesse Marshall earlier, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, well, a goal blaze. I think we will leave it on that note. Plenty of build up and reaction, of course, to come in all of the usual places. Thanks to Paul Gorse, Joe Rimmer, and to Theo Squires for joining me. Until next time, it's goodbye for now.